right, so wait a few minutes that we have uh, a bit of uh, audience before we uh, start. <clears throat> So how is everyone doing? How are things in China? You're having a few cases it's now? Good. Yeah, it's good in China. Right now, we're uh, uh, already relaxing back that. <laughs> back to normal yeah, life? Or... Mm -hmm. So there are no more quarantines or? No, no more. Uh, we even do not need uh, well, our PPE in every, everywhere. It's much better here in China. That's good. I think we have the same condition here in Jordan. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah. We we uh, we almost have zero cases for the last few days, mm -hmm. and uh, we are back to normal. But we are scared of what is coming on in the future, <laughs> as the country yeah. is going to open for tourism. Mm -hmm. And the sad thing, they considered Italy is a green country. That means they can come with that without quarantine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. We will see what will happen. We're, uh, things here are better. We used to have like 5,000 cases a day. Now mm -hmm. we're less than 5,000. We still... I think in Saudi Arabia they are over testing. Yeah, they are doing lots of tests. Yeah, we're doing 66,000. Yeah. Uh, wow. 67,000 wow. yeah. yeah. tests a day. That's good. All of the uh, staffs in our hospital all receive, uh, receive the uh, nuclear acid test for all of our staffs. We get uh, zero positive in our hospital. So that's a good news. Yeah. Excellent. Where are you based in? Mm -hmm. My, my uh, hospital? Yeah. Uh, it's in the southern part of China. Uh, Guangdong okay. province, Guangzhou city, just nearby Hong Kong. Oh yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. And how is the weather now? Uh, it's warm, maybe yeah, hot. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just like uh, you country, I think. <laughs> I think when you compare to Saudi Arabia, I think it's uh, it's the same now. Is that right, <laughs> Abdelaziz? No, I don't know. Nothing like here. That's <laughs> <laughs> 40. Good night. Uh, it's 40. Oh. Yeah, good night. Uh, it's Daytime. 20 now. In Amman, it's 26. Oh, it's a very yeah. comfortable area. Yeah, well, in, in the Dead Sea, it's a, uh, in the Dead Sea, it's 36, which is about 50 <laughs> kilometers from here. In the okay. north, about 20. Ah, it's, it's very nice. It's very small country, variable weather. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, what time is it now? I think we're. Uh... Getting some audience now, so we'll uh, start and hopefully there are more will uh, on the way. So uh, I would like to thank Pusen uh, for uh, arranging uh, this uh, uh, webinar, uh, which uh, going to be about uh, flexible uh, urethroscopy. Uh, our uh, 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 first uh, speaker is hold on. Uh, our first uh, speaker. Uh, is Dr. Uh, Ghazi uh, Aladwan. Uh, he's an associate professor and consultant uh, urologist, and he's uh, head of urology at uh, the uh, Jordan uh, University uh, Hospital in Amman, uh, Jordan. And he'll be uh, speaking to us today uh, about the management uh, of uh, upper tract uh, urinary uh, stone. 
uh, and uh, guidelines. Uh, so, Dr. Ghazi, uh, please uh, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Abdelaziz, for the nice introduction. And uh, once again, I would like to thank uh, Pusin for their uh, uh, organization for this uh, webinar. I will be talking shortly about the management of the upper unit tract uh, stones. Mainly, I will talk a uh, few uh, about the modalities of uh, uh, treatment and uh, some indications and contraindications. I wonder, do you, do you see my slides? Not Can yet. you see my slides? No. You can't? No, I don't see it yet. Yes. You can now? Can you? Yeah, now? yes, it's good. Yeah, okay. Uh, as you all know, we have uh, many, many modalities and approaches how to treat the stones in the upper union tract. And I think all of these approaches depends on the uh, expertise, the experience you have, and what you are uh, good in, uh, you can do. But there are According to the guidelines, there are four main approaches. Chukwebletotripsy, urethroscopy, which uh, whether it is uh, flexible or rigid, uh, laparoscopy and open surgery, percutaneous nephrolithotomy, and all of these modalities, they have their indications and contraindications. Uh, what's regarding the isocorporal chukwebletotripsy, it is really it used to be one of the best methods to treat the upper unit tract. In some centers in the United States now, when you go to the center, you cannot even find this machine exists anymore. Just because of the uh, new modalities of treatment, which is the uh, mini perk and the flexible urethroscopy and laser, these machines, they are not existing anymore, but we cannot ignore them that they are available and they are of a big benefit in many centers and the success and the to start with there are lots of types of machines depending on the manufacturing uh, uh, company there are electromagnetics electrohydraulics uh, piezoelectric and depends on what you are favored with you can choose the machine the uh, the success of sugar that trips it depends on the size of the stone with, which, uh, whether it is ureteral, uh, pelvic, pelvic alicial, the composition of the stone, patient habits, uh, the performance of the shock wave, which is the, uh, the experience of the, of the radiographer and the technician, and uh, uh, whether they, they, you are satisfactory with this machine or not, and in order, in order, in order to have a good, a good shock wave lithotripsy results, we have lots of parameters. First of all, what we call it is the SSD, which is the skin, skin, uh, which is the skin stone distance. Can you see what I'm drawing? And the skin, skin stone distance, if it was more than nine centimeters, the success rate is decreasing by six folds. That means, that means the penetration of the shock wave to the stone will decrease. The other, the other, the other also factors, if we have a stone in the upper calyx here, okay, and we have this long calyx, that will play like a ureter, the, after disintegration and the treatment of the stone using chocolate tripsy, the stone, the, the fragments will be difficult, will have difficulty to pass through down to the ureter. This is one factor. The other factor, narrow infundibulum, like here. This, that means if we are disintegrating a stone in the lower calyx, here, it would be difficult for the fragments to pass through this narrow infundibulum up to the 
up to the renal pelvis and down to the ureter. Another also factor very important, which is the indefindibular uh, pelvic, uh, pelvic angle. If it was steep, like here, that means it's going to be very difficult for a stone also to come up and then to pass to the uh, lower ureter, to the, the ureter. One, one also important factor is the density of the stone. The density of the stone can be defined on the CT scan. And we, I prefer personally to measure the density of the stone before even choosing the type of treatment or the approach to that stone. For example, on the left-hand side here, you can see the stone has two different densities. One of them is the nidus in the middle. You can see the Hans field is about 740. And the outer shell, the shell of the stone, is about 340. The 340 is gonna be very, it's gonna be very effective to receive the shockwave that trepsy. That means we can we can disintegrate the stone, but when we reach the nidus of the stone, it's going to be difficult to disintegrate the stone. It is reported that if the house feed more than 900, the failure rate is more than even nine folds. Okay. What are the complications? When we do when we do shockwave that tripsy for upper urinary tract, whether it's renal or upper urinary tract in the upper ureter, there are three three groups of complications. One group is complication related to the stone fragments. The other one, infection. The third one, which is the more dangerous, is the tissue effect. As you all know, if we have big stone, we did. The I can't hear you, Dr. Razi. I don't know whether if it's only me or everybody else is not hearing you. And Dr. Razi, we don't seem to be hearing you. Dr. Razi, can you hear us? While we're waiting for Dr. Razi to join us again, Dr. Wu, how frequent do you use uh, shockwave lithotripsy nowadays? Uh, I, I think it's a little bit rare to us to use the shockwave. We uh, always perform the operation, the surgery method. I think the shockwave is good, but um, the effective is lower than the surgery. So we usually use the PCNL and uh, IRS and, and so on to deal with the stone disease. We are now yeah. seldom to perform the shockwave. I think I've used shockwave less than 10 times yeah. over the past. And uh, mm -hmm. was the patient insisted that they wanted a shockwave, and I, I don't use it. <laughs> okay. Open. I don't know whether if Dr. Ghazi is still with us or uh, Dr. Ghazi, if you can hear us, can you communicate at least with chat? And if you can't hear us, we'll probably move to the second uh, presentation till uh, this gets sorted out.
seems that Dr. Ghazi is having some issues, so we'll uh, move. We'll come back to Dr. Ghazi later on. Uh, we'll go can, to. Can you hear me now? Can, uh, yeah. can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back. Yeah. <laughs> just, just I received a message that you cannot hear me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll go back then. Okay. We talked about this. Is that right? Can you hear me? We reached the slide. Yeah. Complications, contraindications. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. These and the other modality or the other option for uh, uh, treatment of uh, the upper renal tract is the ureteroscopy, which whether, whether it is a flexible or rigid ureteroscopy for uh, upper renal tract, it can both are feasible. Rigid ureteroscopy can be used for the whole ureter. However, technical improvement as well as availability of digital scopes also favor the use of flexible ureteroscope in the, uh, in the ureter. Most interventions are performed uh, under general anesthesia. Although local or spinal anesthesia is possible, intravenous sedation is suitable for female patients with distal ureteral stones. These are, there are lots, lots in the market, options for flexible ureteroscopes. They are reusable ureteroscopes, fiber optics, digital, chip on the tip, uh, disposable ureteroscopes, digital, they are digital, they are of benefit for the patient, benefit for the hospital, cost effective, they are high, as they are cheap, and the, they are no need to repair them, and they are single patient, single, single use scopes. In, so, in my institution, we use the flexible, reuse uh, uh, disposable flexible ureteroscopes for a patient, then if we did not continue or did not complete clearance of the stone, we can keep this scope for him and plasma, a plasma uh, sterilization of the stone, then we can bring him back and use the same scope with the same effectiveness and then continue our procedure. What about the hydrophilic ones? Do we need? Do we need to do? Do we need to do? Uh, 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 just st to go straight forward and to use the flexible ureteroscope. Uh, me personally, there are two options: how to do a flexible ureteroscopy or even rigid ureteroscopy. For a rigid ureteroscopy, if it was in the lower ureter, I would go and do on a virgin ureter. That means not a prestented ureter. I do a lower ureteroscopy, then treat the stone, laser or pneumatic. Afterwards, I can put a double J stent with a string on. Second day or third day, he will come to my outpatient clinic and I will take out the double J. What about upper ureteric stones or even renal pelvic stones? For upper ureteric stones, I prefer to be, to have the patient prestented. In, 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 if I want to do a rigid or semi-rigid ureteroscopy. For piloscopy, that means I need to treat a stone in the renal pelvis or calluses, I, I, I prefer to use hydrophilic coated ureter axis sheath, which are available in different calibers. The inner, the inner diameter from nine French upwards, they can be inserted via a guide wire these are the outer sheet. This is the inner sheet. The inner sheet, it has a, a two lumens. One lumen for the guide wire, which is the uh, whatever you use, with a sensor wire, with hydrophilic wire. And the other one, you can do a retrograde study just to see whether you are inside the tract, you are inside the renal pelvis. They actually allow easy multiple access uh, to the upper renal tract and therefore significantly facilitate your ureteroscopy. It, it improves the vision by establishing a continuous flow. They decrease internal pressure. Potentially, they reduce the uh, 
they reduce the the uh, t uh, the operating time. The most effective lithotripsy system where that we are everybody is using is the Holman Jaeger laser, and it is now the optimum standard for URS for ureteroscopy. But when you do when you are doing flexible ureteroscopy, the fiber is different than the one you are using in rigid ureteroscopy. We have in our institution from 180 micron to even 400 micron diameter of the, uh, the fiber. I prefer in the, in the kidney, when I treat the stones in the lower calyx or in the upper calyx, just to have a more deflection, I use the smallest caliber, or the smallest diameter uh, uh, fiber optic, uh, fiber optic, uh, uh, the fiber uh, uh, laser. If we, if we want to use the pneumatic or ultrasonic, you have to use the, the rigid ureteroscope for, uh, for the upper or lower ureteroscopes. These are the machines. There are different machines for, for lasers in the market. You can choose from whatever the what you want and depend, then you can, you, can, uh, you can accordingly calibrate your machine what you are doing. The, there are four, four mechanisms to disintegrate the stone. Fragmentation, dusting technique, popcorning, or pop dusting. That means popcorning and dusting at the same time. When you are doing fragmentation, it's fast procedure, but it is excellent for bladder and PCNL. If you are doing fragmentation for the ureter or for the, for the air pelvic, that means you need to take, you will, you will have more time to disintegrate these stones in the smaller fragments. And, and the possibility for complications afterwards is higher. In which idea? These fragments, if they are in big enough, more than four millimeter, they will go down to the editor and they will form a Steinstrasse one, one, one problem. The other problem, you need, they have the chance to rebuild again another stones. Therefore, if you are doing stones in the renal pelvis, it's preferably to start with a dusting technique. No fragments, no basketing, you, know, you don't need to have stones uh, uh, basketing to take them out through the sheath. It will decrease the, uh, uh, the, uh, the use of the ureteral axis sheath. That means if you don't want to use the ureteral axis sheath, you can go with the ureteroscope, the flexible one, through the uh, guide wear up to the renal pelvis, then you can dust the stone completely in one go, then go, come, back, come out. Popcorning, it's, 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 uh, if you have a stone trapped in one of the calyces, you can popcorn it to a small fragments that they do not need to come out using a dome basket. If you have a smaller, uh, uh, if you have stone that is slightly hard, you can popcornic. At the same time, you can do dusting. Here on the right hand side, you can see that we are doing a, a, a laser for a stone that is reasonable in size. It's located in, the, in this calyx here. It's in the mid calyx, but this stone, it has, an, uh, this kidney, it has abnormal ana anatomy. If you can see, it's uh, elongated, more rotation of the kidney. It is, uh, uh, this stone can be treated with, uh, with dusting technique only. And uh, however, when you are dealing with when numerous similar fragments results, which are still big enough to need treatment, but too time consuming to chase individual a second stage. That means you may need, in case, in case you have bigger fragments, uh, remains inside the calyx, you may need to go to trap this stone in one of the calyces and to do 
popcorning and dusting at the same time. Okay, you see now the uh, dust they are over uh, they are overcoming or through the uh, the screen. Here we use the pump machine in order to pump the normal saline, constant pumping, but in a reasonable pressure. Here, as you, as you see, there are small fragments that they are not they are not now they are not suitable for dusting. In this condition. You can, you can do a non-touching technique. You can trap the stone in the middle of the calyx, then you can start firing. And this firing, you allow the, the stone to bounce by itself, by the pressure of the normal saline, they will come and, and they can touch the tip of the, uh, the, tip of the, uh, the fiber, then they will go. Uh, they will go, and they will decrease. They will go. They will come uh, in the in a smaller size. The same one, the same kidney in the upper calyx. Now, you can go and see how we deal with this one. It's the same. You start with dusting by touching technique. Then, if you are, if you have. If you have time, you can continue by dusting technique. If you don't have time or the patient is not, is not well enough, you can use the, the fragmentation technique, which is frag, uh, small fragments. You make it small fragments that they are fit enough to go through the basket and you can pull them down through the sheath outside. This is another modality of, or another type of a flexible utroscope where you have a very clear vision. Yes, of course. And, and here you can see the stones all over, everywhere. You go and check the stones in every calyx, in the upper, mid calyx, like here, and lower calyx as well. These stones can be treated, you can see the stones, they are very, I think they are uh, fragile enough that you can use a dust technique. Can you see this one? Okay, we go for now to the uh, to the uh, uh, third approach or modality of treatment for upper renal tract uh, stones, especially in the uh, which is in the renal pelvis, uh, which uh, our, we we're doing now. We're doing now the percutaneous uh, nephrolithotomy. It is one of the best, one of the most one of the best options to treat big stones in the renal pelvis. But I do believe that if you are professional enough to treat small stones, one or one and a half centimeter, a stone in the, in the renal, in the kidney, you by one go, creating a tract, then go, grab the stone and come out, it is one of the good options to treat these stones. But on the guidelines, the stone has to be big enough or hard enough that cannot be or resistant for shockwave atripsy 
or resistant, you are, can expect that it, it's, it, is, it is too much for the flexible urethroscopy, biloscopy, you can go and do PCNR. Patients who are receiving anticoagulant therapy must be monitored carefully, pre and postoperatively. Anticoagulant therapy must be discontinued before PCNR. Other important contraindications are the same as any other stones to be treated uh, surgically, which is UTI. One of the contraindications is a tumor presumptive in the presumptive axis tract, potential malignant kidney as well, and as well as pregnancy. Ultrasonic and pneumatic system are the most commonly used for, for uh, treating the stones in the near pelvis. Here, in this video, you can see that we are already entered. We are entered. We create the tract. We enter the near pelvis. And in this same condition, we are using the dual action, which is the ultrasonic with suction and the pneumatic at the same time. In this condition, you can do what? You can disintegrate the stone, suck it out, but take a fragment with you in order to analyze the, sto uh, analyze the stone. Although fluoroscopy is the most common intraoperative imaging method, but we use sometimes and most of the time ultrasound just to minimize the use of a fluoroscopy. While doing PCNL, there are two, two options, whether you are leaving the stone with a tube or you are doing a tubeless PCNL, depending depending also on the, the severity or the, uh, yes, the severity of PCNL. Are we doing an aggressive PCNL? Are we doing multiple tracts? Are we doing single tract for a small stone in the inner pelvis? This will give you a hint whether to leave a tube, PCN, uh, 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 nephrostomy, or, or complete tubeless, without nephrostomy and double gestant. Many perks now, when you are using a small sheath in order uh, to access the kidney, most of the time we do not use a, a, a nephrostomy. Sometimes we leave a double gestant for a few days, then we take it out. In order to avoid multiple tracts, it's preferably, what, what, First of all, when we are using multiple tracts, we are using these tracts if we have multiple or multi-located stone in the renal pelvis and the calyx. You treat one stone in the lower calyx, then you need to go and to trace the, uh, the stone in the upper calyx. In order to avoid this, from the same tract, you can use a flexible cystoscope, or at the same time, you can do a supine position and in this supine position, you can access the stone in the upper calyx. Help yourself by pulling the stone to the field where is the, the axis sheath is existing, and then you can treat the stone. How about impacted stones in the upper ureter? You can. You can treat this stone using either rigid or flexible uteroscope, but in this condition, I do not advise to use a pneumatic lithotripsy. What I, what I advise is to use an, a laser that this laser can get rid of the, of the tissue that are building in front of you on top of the stone. You clear out, you clear out the stone from the tissue, then you are, then you treat the stone accordingly. This, sorry, this is back to the same one. 
as you see in this one, we are, to, we are cleaning the stone first from the tissue in front of the stone. We have our own guide wire. It's preferably to have a laser resistant guide wire, but unfortunately in this condition, I use just the normal guide wire. You have to be careful not to cut the guide wire. You, you are, uh, I'm using here dust technique. You clear out the stone, then afterwards, you leave the patient with a double gestin, which is most probably for a few days, and it can come out either with a string on or without a string. It's a day case surgery. In summary, imaging of the kidney with ultrasound acid scan can provide an information about uh, the uh, anatomy of the upper inner tract. Therefore, in the guidelines, we have to do, we have to do an imaging for the upper, for the, uh, for the uh, urinary tract used either by uh, CT scan or an ultrasound. But I strongly recommend, and the, according to the guidelines, prior to the procedure is to do a cystoscopy with a retrograde. This will give you exactly what we are dealing with. Are we dealing with an abnormal anatomy of the ureter? Are we dealing with, with one stone or multiple fragments in the, in the ureter that needs to be overcome by a, a hydrophilic guide wire? And when you are, if you are going to access the upper inner tract with an access sheet, definitely you need to do, to do a, a, a retrograde pyrogram. The fourth modality, which is laparoscopy and open surgery. In laparoscopy and open surgery, advances in trypsy and in the urological surgery, URIS and PSNL, have significantly decreased this type of treatment. But, but sometimes we need to do them. When we, in which cases? In cases that is the stone is resistant for trypsy or resistant even for ureteroscopy if it was in the ureter, or you are unable to do ureteroscopy for some anatomical uh, abnormalities in the ureter, structures in the ureter, rather than damaging the ureter by forcing the ureteroscope, you go and you do your laparoscopic surgery first. If you failed, then you go and do your open surgery. In this condition, as you see, it's a 10 minutes procedure. You do your laparoscopic exploration, you have an idea prior to where to look for the stone. Here, this is the stone here. What we do, you, we identify the stone. You don't have to mobilize the ureter completely, but you need to have an angle not to allow the stone to migrate upwards or downwards. Otherwise, you will lose your stone. The stone is still there. Then you open a longitudinal incision in the ureter, you extract the stone, you put the double J stent anti or retrogradely. I, 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 I usually put the double J by, uh, during laparoscopy from the same hole, then enough to do to put two or three stitches and this will be enough to close the system. And that's all, thank you. Any questions? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ghazi. Uh, we have one uh, question from the uh, uh, audience uh, regarding what laser setting would you use for stone dusting in the ureter to minimize retropulsion? Okay. The, the best thing is when you are dusting the stone is to, to use the low KVs with low joules and high frequency low joule and high frequency. That will allow you to go to the surface stone, low power, that will allow you to dust the stone constantly. You go from one side to the other side, and you do not go, for example, in the middle of the stone, that will cause the stone to, do, to fragment into, piece, into many pieces. Surface, you go from the surface stone, low KVs, which is low, low joule, low power, 
and high frequency. So you can also usually what I use is uh, if I'm using the uh, holmium, I go with uh, point, uh, point 0.4, uh, point yes. 0.3, uh, up to point 0.5, and, and the rate will go with 20, 30. Uh, yes. And if you're, you're in the ureter, you can also have the patient set up. This way, the stone would, the, 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 there would be a column of fluid on top of the stone, keeping the stone so it doesn't migrate uh, up uh, into the kidney. Uh, other things that you might uh, use also, uh, the newer version or the newer generations of uh, laser available in the market now, like the Moses uh, from uh, yeah. Luminous or the more uh, recent uh, Thulium Fiber, where actually uh, it's almost eliminated the propulsion uh, with, uh, you can use as low as a very, very, very low uh, uh, power and you can go with the rate up to 150 and you would have almost no retropulsion uh, at all. Uh, it's not available everywhere. It's just uh, launched in Saudi. I think they sold uh, one or two devices here. Uh, it should be more available uh, in uh, other part uh, of the world uh, pretty, uh, pretty soon. Uh, I have um, another question. So uh, personally, I uh, I've never used uh, PCNL for a one centimeter stone uh, or 1.5. Uh, I've used it for maybe 1.5, I've used it. Uh, but uh, with the many perks, if, you, if you're thinking about doing uh, PCNL for small uh, uh, renal uh, stones, you can do many perks with uh, smaller uh, access and you won't even have uh, to leave a double J stamp uh, after the procedure, you just go in, clear the stone, and then take the access sheet uh, out. You can go with uh, the clear Petra or the mini perms. They, 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 they come in many sizes. Uh, uh, they come in uh, uh, as low as eight uh, French, where you can use the needle scope, uh, but I personally prefer the larger ones where you can use a bigger scope than the needle scope, like 11. 16 uh, access uh, sheet. Uh, but if you have a stone more than one centimeter, more than two centimeters, I personally won't use the uh, mini perk because it just takes forever to, uh, to, uh, to dust the stone and get it through that uh, small access sheet. I would usually go with a standard uh, PCNL uh, 24 or 30 French and just clear it in no time. I don't know uh, whether if, uh, uh, if, uh, if you use these uh, many perks for smaller renal stones or uh, or no, Dr. Razi? Yes, I do. For kids, I do uh, the many perks. But back to the stones, which is one, one and a half centimeter. Sometimes even, even you can go in one go, even without disintegration of the stone. You can cut or slice the sheath. Even grab it if you, get the, if you use the 30 French. Just yes, you can it. slice it. You can slice it longitudinally, completely, and you can grab the stone one and a half centimeter and put it in the sheath, which it will be. It will distend. Then it will. You will come out completely with the sheath and the stone within the sheath, in one go. This way, I've learned this from Professor Tom Skying in Australia, and he used to do these things, just one go. Five minutes, he does the tract and he put his sheath, cut it longitudinally, then he take the stone in, put it in the sheath and come out. No nephrostomy, no double gestin. One, nice. of, one of the ways we can, one of the tricks, but I, 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 I totally agree with you. Many, um, two or three tracts, two or three tracts will not harm the kidney. Because you are, we are what you are using to to create the tract. Are you using the balloon the balloon dissector, or you are using the implant sheet in creating your tract? Or who's do who's doing the tract for you? Are you doing the tract, or uh, you are you are getting the radiologist to do it for you? Personally, I do all my tracts. Yes. Uh, I all get the radiology involved if I'm. Uh, because I'm not uh, very well uh, trained with uh, ultrasound access, I do it uh, the, uh, the regular uh, way with uh, fluoroscopy. Uh, I'm, 
I've been playing with ultrasound every now and then, but if I'm afraid if, uh, for uh, a uh, retrorenal uh, liver or retrorenal spleen, uh, then I get radiology uh, to help with the uh, cleaning, if, especially if I'm going up or fall. Uh, and if I'm afraid of the uh, getting through the spleen or the liver, then I have the interventional radiology with me in the OR, so I don't send my patients down to interventional radiology. No, I have them with me in the OR uh, just to make sure that I don't go through the liver or the spleen, and then we get the access. And uh, regarding the position, uh, we mentioned that prone and supine position. Do you prefer uh, uh, which setting, or you are? So it's all right with you, supine and prone? Uh, the, uh, the right way, which is the uh, supine, the, the, sorry, the prone, because it's anatomically okay. better in the kidney. Uh, yes, uh, some uh, would like to the supine position, but I don't like it that you can come all over you, and it's just, it's not worth it. And, and yeah, it's a good, to, 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 uh, yeah. It's with ejection fraction 10, 15, and it went uh, okay. I think we're uh, restraining the yeah. time now. Uh, so I'll share my screen. Thank you very much again, Dr. Razi, for this uh, night presentation. And now I will go uh, to the. Uh, and now we'll uh, give you uh, the second presentation about the clinical uh, application of a single-use ureteroscopy by Dr. Rong Pi Wu. Uh, he's a consultant uh, urologist at uh, the uh, first affiliated hospital of uh, Sun Yat-sen uh, University in uh, China. So Dr. Wu, please uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you. And I'll share my screen here. All right. Can you see my uh, palm point? Can you see yeah. my yeah. slides here? Yeah, okay. Okay, it's very nice to talk about you, uh, talk with you about the uh, uteroscope, something uh, something new in here. Um, I'm Dr. Wu from the first hospital, Science University. And you can see here is my uh, university. Sciencing University is one of the uh, top universities in China. And my hospital is one of the best hospitals in China too. And uh, our hospital and our university is located in Guangzhou city. Guangzhou city is the third biggest city in China. It's a very huge uh, mega city in, in China. Our Guangzhou city is located in the southern part of the uh, our, our country, and just nearby Hong Kong. You can see here, Guangzhou is a subtropic area in China. So right now our weather is warm and hot. It's about thirty six degree in the mid uh, mid uh, mid of the day, uh, and just like the. Uh, Dr. Kazi just mentioned that the stone disease is one of the very common disease all over the world, especially in our city, in our uh, southern part of China. We have some uh, methods to deal with the uh, kidney stone. One is open surgery. Usually we do not uh, do this uh, open surgery anymore for decades because we have another options for the uh, minimally invasive method to deal with the kidney stone. One is a, a shockwave release trip, tripsy, and another is percutaneous technique, and the uh, the last one is a flexible uh, ureteroscope technique. So uh, right now, the flexible ureteroscope, we can see uh, usually uh, three type of the scope. One is a fiber optic flexible ureteroscope. Another is reusable digital flexible ureteroscope. And the uh, brand new is a disposable flexible ureteroscope. 
So one of the uh, characteristic of the uh, flexible ureter scope is the durability. As we know, the uh, flexible scope is very expensive and is easy to uh, broken. So the durability is one of the limitation for us to uh, applicate the scope in the clinical works. So you can see this uh, very nice picture, just like the staring uh, sky in the night. That's very uh, beautiful, but it's not a good sign for us for the uh, urology surgery because this view is means the damage of the optical uh, fiber optic uh, ureter scope. So for this kind of uh, broken uh, scope, we cannot see anything during the surgery. So we cannot perform the surgery very good. Usually the, uh, the easy broken part of the uh, flexible ureter scope is a, is a deflection part of the scope just like this is broken and sometimes is a leaking of the scope. So here is a paper to analysis the durability of digital flexible ureter scope in an academic setting with multiple surgeons. Uh, they use a, a very expensive uh, digital ureter scope with a, a analysis in the source flex XC. You know, it's a, one of the best flexible ureter scope the ureter scope will prospectively record over a 12 month period. All ureter scopes were performed with this uh, very nice, uh, the, one of the best uh, digital ureter scope. So uh, they found there is a total of 11 ureter scope damaged beyond repair during this time period uh, with an average usage about uh, 40.5 cases per scope. All damages occurred as a, a deflection tip the cost analysis review the cost of about 1,086 US dollar per use uh, and the maintenance cost not include. So the, based on their experience, it appears that these instruments are not as durable as we would have hoped is easy to broken. So uh, just like us uh, in our hospital, we have a uh, some digital uh, flexible ureter scope. Some, some scope is on the repairing and some scope is on the way to the, uh, the, the repairing. So the durability of the flexible ureter scope is one of the big problem for us to applicate the scope in the clinical work. For the disposable single use flexible ureter scope, it's single use. So do not need maintenance, do not need to repair. We just open it, use it, and store it. Another thing is the reprocessing time of the ureter scope. As we know, when we finished a case of the uh, ureter scope, we need to get the scope to transfer to print cleaning, a leakage testing, cleaning again, and rinsing, and the disfection and rinse again and drying it and transfer to the store. When a new case comes out, we must find the scope and the check scope uh, is it uh, external wrap inspection and uh, unwrap it. Then we can perform the next case. So we have a, a very long time to reprocess in the scape for the uh, new patient. If the uh, check is not available, the case must to, uh, to reschedule for the new case. For the single use uh, ureter scope, we do not need any reprocessing time. We just open it and use it. So usually the reprocessing of the reusable flexible, uh, flexible ureter scope in, includes a pre-cleaning, leak testing, manual cleaning, rinsing, drying, sterilization, and uh, a storage, and studied all over again and again for the new cases. So uh, the time of the reprocessing uh, procedure usually need one and a half hour or two half hour. For the disposable single-use flexible ureter scope, it's 
uh, single use, no reprocessing. So we can uh, perform the operation uh, continually for the uh, series of patients. Another thing is the image quality. If we cannot see anything of the uh, sur surgery view, we cannot perform the uh, good surgery. So the image quality of the scope is very important for us to, uh, uh, to perform the operation. As we know, the reusable of the uh, flexible ureter scope is two types of it. One is the fiber optic, another is digital. The fiber optic uh, scope is made by the optic fibers. So the resolution is limited by the number of the op optic fibers inside the scope. And the image quality is not uh, very satisfying for us. And the digital uh, scope, because the image uh, apparatus is a CCD or CMOS, it can get a very high uh, resolution. So the digital one is much more uh, clear for us to uh, see the inside the kidney of the patient. Here's a paper to compare different type of the uh, flexible scopes, including the fiber optic and the di digital one. So today the most fiber optic flexible scope have been replaced by the digital in the scope uh, due to the better image quality and the fidelity. So his paper just compare uh, about a different type of the scope. We can see here is a four imaging. One is the uh, left upper is a uh, fiber optic scope ju just like us we use for many years. Uh, it's very good, but the uh, image quality is not so satisfying. It's just like the uh, network op optic field. And another one, the right upper one, the right upper one is uh, the one of the best uh, flexible uroscope, the Stars XC. So uh, the image quality is very nice, uh, but this this kind of scope is much expensive. Uh, the left lower one is a uh, Poussin uh, formal version, is old version. The Image quality is better than the optical one, but it's not so uh, satisfying for us because it still have something we cannot see around the uh, field. And the right lower one is the Poussin new version. So this one is very nice. So I think we, right now we get the Poussin uh, scope, the field just like this one, the Poussin new version. It's much better. So for the image quality, the best one is a reusable digital uh, flexible ureter scope. Of course, uh, uh, it's the best, but the, the cost is the most expensive for us. And the second one is a disposable new version um, flexible ureter scope. It's uh, almost similar to the reusable one, uh, a little bit, um, uh, a little bit uh, lower re resolution of the image quality, but it's, it's, uh, it's good enough for us. And the third one is the disposable former, the old version of the uh, flexible user scope. The last one is the fiber optic, of course that. And another thing is fun uh, functionality. Uh, the functionality of the scope is very important for us to perform the operation. The all Modern flexible rotoscope have the deflection at least 270 degrees. Uh, but the different type of the scope, different companies' uh, scope have a different deflection angle. Here's another paper to compare uh, some single-use digital flexible rotoscope. We can see the Poussin one is uh, uh, the good one. And here's another paper to compare uh, eight kind, eight type of the flexible ureter scope uh, for the empty working channel with the laser fiber, with the basket, and with a, a guard wire inside the scope, and with the bubbles of forceps. So the ranking of all, the, all of the flexible ureter scope, uh, the digital, uh, the mm, disposable single use flexible ureter scope. Um, it's good enough, I think. The ranking number is good. 
So here's a, a plus one and another uh, flexible scope. We can see the uh, flexible angle and the diameter is different. The plus one will be the better one compared to the other type of the uh, flexible scope. So here's a video clip here you can see here. Uh, I use it in my open room. It can uh, have the much um, acute curve of the tip of the scope. So we can try this scope to uh, deal with uh, a very sharp angle of the uh, calyx of the stone disease inside the kidney. So the good uh, functionality for us is good for us to perform the operation. So for the functionality, I think the disposable flexible ureter scope is similar to the reusable flexible uh, ureter scope. Um, because the re reusable flexible ureter scope is good, but it's, it's still expensive. The fifth thing is the cross infection. Here's a paper just mentioned us that the outbreak of the independent resistant enterobacter urinary tract infection due to a contaminated ureteroscope is a very terrible uh, bacteria to get the uh, severe infection. So for the highly uh, skilled working force is needed to sterilize the, uh, the increasing number of the complicated instrument uh, used in the healthcare environment. So uh, in some hospital, sterile processing department are viewed by hospital executive as a causal center, I think is one of the problem. So if the goal is to cut costs, sterile processing personnel will have not enough resource to uh, do the sterile and the processing they need. Here's another paper to show us the effectiveness of sterilization for the flexible ureteroscope in the real world study. So they found that the flexible ureteroscope reprocessing method were insufficient and maybe have introduced contamination. They check all of the uh, ureteroscope with the uh, uh, standard reprocessing procedure. They found some residue fluid inside the scope. They found the formula white residue inside the scope. And they can find the debris in the, in the scope channels. And here's uh, about 13% uh, endoscope can uh, find the microbial uh, growth. And here's a deno adenosine triphosphate we found in 44% of all of the uh, ureteroscope. And here's uh, about 60, 63% ureteroscope can find the hemoglobin after use with the patient. So here is a very high risk to get the cross infection if the patient, the last patient have some infectious disease. Uh, for the disposable single-use flexible ureteroscope, because it's single-use, always new, always sterile, so it's no infect, uh, no risk of for, for the cross infection. That's one of the good things. The last thing is the economic problem. So the cost of a new reusable scope is about uh, seventeen thousand uh, euro with the repair bill is much more than uh, 18,000 euro. Uh, here is a report that over 118 cases, uh, the work out, uh, this works out as about 500 euro per case. The claim cost uh, is made about uh, 18 euro per case. So the total amount per use for reusable flexible ureteroscope is estimated to be 577 euro per case. But uh, we just mentioned, if you can use a, a ureteroscope more than 180 cases without repairing, you can get this number. This uh, single use flexible ureteroscope right now is estimated to cost about 700 to 1000 euro per instrument. But I just like I uh, mentioned in the beginning of my uh, presentation, uh, there is a, a paper to 
uh, analysis the durability of the digital flex wire telescope in one um, academic uh, center. So they found here is the 11 year telescope damaged beyond repair during its uh, 12, 12 months uh, period. Uh, the average usage is 14.5 cases per scope. So we cannot use the scope over 118 uh, cases. The cost analysis review amounts cost of about uh, 1,000 US dollar per use. And the maintenance and the repair cost not include. So the cost of the repairing uh, has greatest impact on cost per case uh, with a reusable uh, de uh, device. Uh, but there is no cost of repairing for disposable flex regulator scope at all. So uh, I just talk about the durability reprocessing time, image quality, functionality, cross-infection, and the economy of the, uh, these two kind of the uh, flexible ureter scope. The uh, single-use scope with a high uh, image quality has no uh, maintenance, no repairing, and then no cross-infection. I think, I think it will be uh, very good for us to perform this kind of surgery for the patient. So in the future, what we can do in the future? I think the techn technology perspective includes uh, the minimal of the scope. Right now we get the scope about uh, 9 to 9.5 French. I think the uh, 7.5 French a person just launched last year. Uh, in the future, we can get much thinner, much thinner uh, scope for the patient with a narrow ureter or for the patient, uh, for the uh, children patient. Another thing is the irrigation working channel will be wider. We can uh, use a wider working channel to get a much better, a much better surgery view. Another thing is uh, better functionality to improve our surgery and better image quality to give us a clean view during the, during the uh, operation. And the finally, cost control is very important for us to use this uh, single use disposable one. So I think the disposable uh, flexible ureter scope is not perfect, but it is still uh, evolution and the future is looking bright just like my hometown, Guangzhou City. So welcome you to visit my uh, hometown, Guangzhou City in the near future. I think if the COVID-19 crisis will be uh, deal with it in the near future. Finally, welcome to our wonderland. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Wu, mm -hmm. for this uh, nice uh, presentation. Uh, well uh, prepared. Uh, how many uh, cases do you do uh, a year? And how many of these cases are done with uh, flexible, uh, reusable, and how many of these are with uh, disposable? And how many types of disposable uh, ureteroscopy do you use? Have you used anything, uh, any other devices, or only the, pu the uh, Pusen? <laughs> Um, my hospital is one of the best hospitals in China, so we have a lot of cases per year. Um, in last year, in whole of our department just uh, already performed more than 5,000 cases for operation. And for myself, uh, last year I performed about 500 cases. And uh, I think it is about uh, 30% patient receive the uh, flexible ureteroscope surgery. In our hospital, um, we do not have the uh, single use flexible uh, ureteroscope last year because the person one is just approved by the government this year. Uh, we use the uh, reusable 
flexible ureter scope, uh, the stores one, the very expensive one. But uh, last two years, uh, we're leading the, the uh, clinical trial for the Pusen uh, flexible ureter scope for two years. So we have the Pusen uh, scope for two years to uh, perform the clinical trial uh, just uh, authorized by the government. So I use this kind of uh, scope for uh, two years. It's very good. And another kind of the disposable uh, ureter scope not proved in China. So I do not use another type of the uh, disposable one, just put them. And so for the audience, I think uh, disposable ureter scopes are nice and I, I have nothing uh, to add uh, after what Dr. Wu will say and has a presentation, but it's not for everyone. If you have, if you're a high volume center, then it's gonna be very costly to do, if you do like a thousand eritroscopy, it's gonna be very, very costly to do all of the with uh, disposable uh, erythroscopes. So um, you have to combine uh, both reusable and uh, disposable. So you use your, uh, uh, first you have to be experienced, if you're doing a thousand case say, per year, then you're experienced, so you can get more out of your reusable scope. Of, sometimes we get in our scopes more than 40. In few cases, if only handled by the urologist, we can get up to eight use in one ureter scope. Uh, so um, uh, then you have to use your scope for your straightforward uh, cases, they're reusable for your large stone, complex cases, uh, lower pole stones, then you use your uh, disposable scope. The cases that you're afraid might uh, damage your uh, reusable scopes. And this way, with this combination, then you can prolong the life of your reusable scopes and use less uh, disposable uh, scopes. But if you're a very low uh, volume uh, center, uh, then you're not very experienced with uh, your atroscopy and so on, then I think you'd you're, it's, you're better off using um, disposable scopes, especially in private practice. If you're in a private practice and there are seven or six uh, urologists, they're all general urologists, not uh, all endourologists, then you're better off having disposable scopes. So if they damage one per case, then you're good to go with the other cases with, for the other uh, surgeons. I don't know what you think, uh, Dr. Ghazi. Yes, I, uh, I totally agree. And I think in a training center, you cannot risk to have your uh, reusable scope damaged by your trainee, because as you know, they cannot handle the scope correctly. Once you are, they are using the scope, I, ha I noticed one, I was a witness on one case, I was nearly, my, I had heart attack. When I, wa I was watching my trainee using the fiber, not checking the fiber was cracked and he fired inside the scope and oh. that's it 18,000 JD's gun with the wind the other okay. comment that I have I have an opinion this one which is if you are going to do for example a diagnostic urethroscopy there is no harm to use your reusable high quality urethroscope if you are doing an interventional one a procedure that will need more than one hour and a half, that you will need lots of deflection, and you may damage the st damage the scope. It's preferably to use the re re the disposable one. Once you are done with this case, it's got it's, uh, the scope is going to the garbage. Is that right? Yeah, correct, absolutely right. And there are now. It's good we have more and more disposable. Uh, scopes. Uh, Pusen, when they first uh, came out, uh, Dr. Wu showed the video, the image quality was not uh, as good as uh, it's uh, now these days. They improved on their lighting and the software. So they used to have that black crescent at the uh, bottom of the uh, image. But now it's better, I think, because they have competition. They have the uh, Boston Scientific, which is equally good. It's a, it has a larger uh, caliber, that's one uh, disadvantage. The OTU is also uh, a good competitor. They have uh, comparable uh, image uh, quality. They have the dual light system. Uh, the, 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 the caliber is 8.6. 8 
and the stores is uh, coming with one uh, pretty soon. I've tried it, it was not good, so they're improving on it. Um, uh, who else is coming? Bard is coming with one uh, as well. And there is another Chinese company, they have a black scope, I forgot the name, so it's good. That's we have more and more uh, companies uh, competing with each other for a better quality and eventually uh, better uh, pricing for uh, these. Uh, like when, when the uh, Boston Scientific first came out with their, uh, with their scope, they were selling it for almost uh, 2,500 US dollar. Yeah. Now yeah, it's yeah. less than 1,500. So because there are lots of competitors. And I think nowadays they're offering it for us for even less than a thousand dollars. So would, I think it would even go uh, lower and lower with, uh, with uh, many uh, competitors. And I don't know if any of the audience have any uh, questions for uh, our panelists uh, or uh, no, I don't know, Dr. Wong, if you have any, uh, Dr. Wu, if you have any other uh, comments on these disposable scopes. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, use this kind of uh, scope to deal with the stone disease in the most uh, situation, but uh, I uh, should mention that sometimes sometimes we use the scope to check the pelvis and the calyx with the tumor disease. So for this kind of uh, cases, I uh, think the reusable one will be better because they have the better uh, image quality. For the uh, stone for the disease... Picks, uh, that's for the digital ones, but for the fiber optic, I think some of the newer versions of the disposable are have comparable, if not better, image. But for the digital, <laughs> yeah, not. yeah, yeah, it's good. Uh, but the, uh, I think the expensive ones is still have the advantage for the uh, image quality right now. Maybe in the future, the disposable one uh, will be better. I think. So uh, right now, I choose the uh, reusable di uh, digital. Uh, endoscope for the so, uh, for the uh, tumor disease, and I like to choose the disposable one for the stone disease. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, I have one question for you. Do you use the access sheet mm -hmm. navigator for a big stone uh, yes, in the uh, pelvis? Uh, yeah, for all of the case, I use the uh, access sheets to yeah. lower the uh, pelvic pressure and. Uh, to uh, bring the stone fragment out easily. I use the access sheets for all the case. Yeah, especially for the disposable because it's a bit larger and uh, to protect the ureter, you should, I always use uh, access sheet. Uh, I don't use access sheet, uh, the patient is pre-stented and uh, the stone burden is not that large. Uh, or if I'm using the flex x uh, which is the smallest uh, scope uh, available nowadays. But other than that, I always, almost always uh, use an uh, access sheet. Mm -hmm. right, yeah, so, I agree with you. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wu, Dr. Ghazi for uh, being with us today. Uh, once again, I would like uh, to thank uh, Pusen uh, for uh, arranging for this uh, webinar. And uh, I would like to thank uh, our uh, audience uh, for uh, being with us uh, today. Uh, and thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.